want to study with you tonight a piece of Talmud which at first glance seems somewhat enigmatic. But first, let me begin with an anecdote. There was once a very wealthy Jew in a community, but always refused giving charity for any causes of the community. And his excuse was always, I have a very poor brother who's destitute and has 11 children. I have a poverty-stricken sister who has many children and doesn't have a penny to her name. I have another brother who's very ill and also very poor. So the local community thought, no, he's rich, but if he has to support so many families, I guess his uh, charity is already depleted. And so for many years when they would come to him, he would say, listen, I have a poor brother with 11 children and so on and so forth. Once they decided to investigate. They wrote a letter to this man's brother and they said, do you get money from your rich brother? And he writes them back money. For years I've been begging him to help me out in my desperate situation. My sister has been begging him. My other brother has been begging him. And he always refuses us. He never shared with us a single dollar. They were furious. How can he lie for so many years in such a vicious way? They come running to him and they say, you have such chutzpah, you have such audacity. Whenever we ask you for charity, you tell us you have a poor brother with 11 children and so on and so forth. And now it turns out your brother tells us you don't give him anything. And the man says, you misunderstood me. What I meant to tell you was this. What we call in our literature a kal v'choymer. Madoch, my own brother who has 11 children, I don't give him anything. I have a brother who has 11 children, I don't give him a thing. So you expect I should give you for the community something? Certainly I won't give you. This attitude of stinginess versus generosity is an issue we're going to be addressing this evening. The opening of the portion of Lech Lecha, God speaks to the person who would become the first Jew to undertake the first and most fateful journey of his life. Open up source number one. God tells Abraham, Lech Lecha me artzachom, me meladatachom, me beisavichom, Leave your land, your birthplace, the home of your father. Go to the land which I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. And you will be a blessing. The Talmud wants to understand what is the meaning of all these seemingly rep- uh, repetitions different promises that all seem very similar. I mean, first he says, I'll make you into a great nation. Then he says, I'll bless you. Then he says, I'll make your name great. Then he says, you'll become a blessing. You will be a blessing. It seems like a redundancy. Source number two says the Talmud in Tractate Psachim, Dav Kuf Yud Zayin Amit Beis. Psachim 117b. Omar Reb Shimon ben Tlakish. Rabbi Shimon, the son of Lakish, one of the great Talmudic sages, said, When God promises Abraham, I will make you into a great nation, this is why we say in the opening of our Amida prayers, God is the God of Avram Avinu. We identify God as the God of Abraham. This is the fulfillment of the promise, I will make you into a great nation. When God promises Abraham, I will bless you. This is why we identify God in the beginning of our prayers, the God of Yitzchak, the God of Isaac, the son of Abraham. I will make your name great. This is a reference to the fact that in the opening of all of our prayers, we identify God as the God of Jacob, the God of Yaakov. So these are not just redundancies. These are all references to a fascinating fact in Jewish tradition. God is not only the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. God was also the God of Adam, the God of Noach, the God of Moses, the God of Joseph, the God of David. Yet, in the opening of every Jewish Amida prayer, three times a day, 
we say, Baruch Atah Hashem, blessed are you God. Elekeinu Elekei Aviseinu, our God and the God of our fathers. And then we say, Elekei Avraham, Elekei Yitzchak, Elekei Yaakov. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Why these three names? Why do we identify God as being the God of these three people? What was their uniqueness? Says Reb Shimon ben Lakish in the Talmud, it's in the verse in the opening of Lech Lecha. When God tells Abraham, I will make you into a great nation, that greatness is expressed in the fact that for eternity we identify Hashem, God, with Avram Avinu, the God of Abraham. When God tells Avram Avinu, I will bless you, it's expressed in the fact that his son Yitzchak is forever remembered and we always identify our God as being the God of Yitzchak, like Yitzchak. That Yitzchak chose him as his God. And Vagad Lashmecha, I will make your name great, is expressed in the fact that his grandson Yaakov is also chosen to be associated with God. We call God the Lekei Yaakov, the God of Jacob. But then the Talmud continues, next paragraph in source number two. Yachal Yiu Chosman Bekulam. We might think that you should conclude the blessing, the opening blessing of the prayer, also with mentioning all of the patriarchs, Talmud Loimar, therefore the verse concludes, and you shall be a blessing. You will be a blessing, implying that with you we will conclude the blessing. We will not conclude the blessing by mentioning the other patriarchs. So in the opening of the Amidah, in the opening of the blessing, we say, Elekei Avram, Elekei Yitzchak, Elekei Yaakov. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. But at the end of the blessing, we say, Melech Oizir, Meshia, Omage. The king who helps, who saves, who protects. Baruch Atah Hashem, blessed are you God. Magein Avram. The shield, the protector of Avram. We don't say, Magein Yitzchak, Magein Yaakov, the shield of Isaac, the shield of Jacob. Why not? In the beginning, we said he was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Why at the end is it Magin Avram, only the shield of Avram? So this is what the Talmud explains. That God tells Abraham, I will turn you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. This refers to he and his son and his grandson. But then he continues, You shall become a blessing. You shall become a blessing. That at the end of the blessing, it's only you. We will only conceal and conclude the blessing. With a mention of Avraham and not Yitzchak and Yaakov, only with Abraham, not with Isaac and Jacob. At first glance, it's very difficult to understand this piece of the Talmud. God is promising Abraham, don't worry, don't think we're going to finish with everybody. When we conclude the blessing, it's Bechach Chaisman, it's only with you. What? Was Avraham Avinu, was Abraham afraid to share the spotlight with his son and with his grandson? Generally, a father is not afraid to share the spotlight with his own children or his grandchildren. Especially a person like Avraham Avinu, our father Abraham. Especially when it comes to his son Yitzchak, who he waited for for 100 years and begged and pleaded and beseeched and prayed to God to give him the son as his ear, as his future. Was Abraham hurt by the fact that in the opening of the blessing of every Amida prayer, we include also the name of his son and his grandson, so God consoles him and says, don't worry. When, at the end, when we come to the end of the blessing, the spotlight will be completely focused on you. <laughs> the video will zoom in completely on you. It will exclude any mention of Yitzhak and Yaakov. What's the meaning of this? What's going on there? What's the nature of this promise? You might think that we'll conclude with everybody, no, don't worry, B'chach been only with you. I want to present to you tonight three interpretations quoted in different sources. Each one, I believe, carries a very powerful and moving message and a very relevant message. The first interpretation is from the Hasidic master known as the Bnei Yisoschor by Rabbi Tzvi Elimelech of Dinov, one of the great masters. And he presents the following interpretation. It's known that each of the patriarchs 
represented a certain characteristic which would shape and define their descendants for generations. The Mishnah says in the opening of the ethics of our fathers, the world stands on three things, on the study of Torah, on service, sacrifice, and on charity, benevolence, sharing, kindness. Avraham Avinu, our first father, is the pillar of Gemilas Chassad, the paradigm of philanthropy, of giving, of sharing. We have him in the Torah inviting guests over to his tent, feeding him with great kindness and generosity. Avraham Avinu is the man who reaches out to the poor, who saves the oppressed, who goes to war to rescue victims. Avraham Avinu is the paradigm for sharing, for giving, for philanthropy, for tzedakah, for charity in the Jewish world. Yitzchak, the second one of our patriarchs, represents Avoida, prayer, sacrifice. He was ready to sacrifice his entire life as an adult on the Mariah Mountain. It was he who was ready to sacrifice himself. We have a reference to Yitzchak, our patriarch Isaac, involved in prayer, in meditation. By Yitzchak, Yitzchak represents the quality of service, of sacrifice, of submission. Yitzchak is the silent one among the patriarchs, the one who represents silent, deep commitment and surrender, complete self-effacement. Yaakov is discussed as the studious one, the one who was involved in study. The Torah identifies him already as a child. Jacob was wholesome. He sat in the tents. Which tents? Our sages explain. Rashi quotes, he sat and he learned. He was in yeshiva. Jacob is associated with study. When he goes down to Egypt, he sends Yehuda. To build the yeshiva, Jacob is immersed in study, despite all of the events of his life, he's the paradigm of learning, of study, and of Torah. Throughout Jewish history, we connect to God through these three people, through these three characteristics, through Avram, through Yitzchak Yaakov. The Jew finds God in Avram. We look at God and we say, God is the God of Abraham. And we say, God is the God of Yitzchak, and God is the God of Jacob, of Yaakov. We find God in prayer. We find God in the learning, in study. We find God. A Jew opens up a book of Torah and studies, and there he or she finds God. And we find God in love, in giving, in sharing, in philanthropy. So when we open up our prayer, who is God? Elekei Avraham, Elekei Yitzchak, Elekei Yaakov. We find God through the quality of giving represented by Avram. We find God through the quality of service and prayer and sacrifice represented by Yitzchak. And we find God through learning and study. Torah represented by Yaakov. Now the Talmud says, You might think that at the end, at the conclusion, the conclusion of what? Not just the conclusion of the first blessing, the conclusion of exile. The last generations of Jews, as Jewish history comes closer to its climax, to the redemption through Mashiach, when we come to the closure, to the conclusion of the years of exile, lest you think then too, we will find God through Avram and Yitzchak and Yaakov, Elokei Avram, Elokei Yitzchak, Elokei Yaakov. The Jewish people will find God through all these qualities? Says the Talmud, God told Abraham, no. At the concluding generations of exile, before Mashiach comes, the Jewish people will say one thing, Mogin Avram, he's the shield of Abraham. And let's understand this. In the time when the Talmud was written, it was inconceivable that there will be a generation of Jews that would not have the full imprint of Jacob's legacy, the legacy of study, of Yitzchak, Isaac's legacy, the legacy of prayer and sacrifice, and Abraham's legacy, the legacy of philanthropy, of giving. Jews throughout their history always had three paths and always found God in all three places. But we, the generation before Mashiach, towards the end of exile, understand very well what the Talmud is saying. 
Suddenly, the last few hundred years, our nation has been devastated in so many ways. Not just through physical annihilation, but also through spiritual annihilation, through the powerful forces of assimilation that caused millions of Jews to disappear from the midst of our people, and it continues every single day. So we live today in a generation where often, among so many of our brothers and sisters, you will not find the imprint of Yaakov Avinu. You will not find Eleke Yaakov. You will not find God through the characteristic of Jacob through study of Torah. They once asked a Jew, what is the difference between ignorance and apathy? And he said, I don't know and I don't care. We live in a generation of tremendous ignorance. How many millions of Jews are deprived of the richness of a Jewish education, of the depth of Torah learning, of the excitement and the passion of a blood Gemara, a page of Talmud, a verse of Chumash, a chapter of Mishnayis. Most of our, most of our brothers and sisters, most of our children, of our people, don't know how to read Aleph Beis. They don't know the Hebrew alphabet. I heard from the former chief rabbi of Israel, Rabbi Israel Meir Lau, to presently the chief rabbi of Tel Aviv, at a yardside gathering in honor of my late father of blessed memory. So he spoke and he said that just a little while before his devastating stroke, the then prime minister of Israel, Ariel Sharon, phoned him. It was Friday afternoon, he said, and he said he has to meet him about something. What does he have to meet him? He asked a few youngsters in Israel if they know what Ma'ariv is. And they said, sure, it's a daily Israeli newspaper. One of the few prominent Israeli dailies is the Ma'ariv. And Sharon says, that's all you know? They said, yeah, that's Ma'ariv. And Sharon, <laughs> who himself was a secular Jew, was upset. They didn't know that Ma'ariv is one of the th- Ma'ariv is one of the three daily prayers of Jewish tradition: Shachris, Mincha, and Arvis. It actually happens to be the prayer that corresponds to Yaakov. So he was extremely uh, upset, and he called Rabbi Lau. He has to meet because such ignorance, he co- even he couldn't accept. I think uh, they say in the name of Prime Minister Golda Meir, the Prime Minister of Israel that even though she was a clearly secular uh, woman, she still felt there should be a strong Jewish education in the Israeli schools. And they say in her name that she supposedly said, I want that our children should know what they don't believe in. You know the story they tell about a, uh, a father who came to a Hebrew school where his son David would go every Sunday to study a little bit about Judaism, and it was sponsored by the temple where they prayed on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. So once the father comes into the Hebrew school and he meets his son and he says, David, how's it going? And David says, it's great. So he says, David, let me ask you a question. Are you learning here? He says, yes, I'm learning. It's really good. I'm learning so much about our tradition. So the father says, David, tell me, who broke the tablets? And the son looks at his father with a terrified look and he says, Dad, it was not me. I did not do it. The father was very upset. Goes into the classroom and asks to speak to the teacher, Mr. Cohen. Mr. Cohen, are you the teacher of these children? Yes, I am. Mr. Cohen, this is extremely upsetting. I came and I asked my son, David, who broke the tablets? And you know what he tells me? It was not me. It was not me. I didn't do it teacher looks at him and says, Sir, I now know your son David for seven months. If he said he didn't do it, he didn't do it. An infuriated parent runs into the office of the principal. Mr. Engel, are you the principal of this Hebrew school? Yes, I am. What is going on in your school? I ask my son who broke the tablets. He says, it was not me. I didn't do it. I ask his teacher who broke the tablets, and he says, If he says he didn't do it, he didn't do it. What type of school are you running? And the principal tells him, I'm so sorry, sir. I understand you're very upset. Let me assure you one thing. We, the school, will recompensate you for the broken tablets. Just give us a receipt, and we'll pay you the full sum. And I'm sorry for the loss of these broken tablets. We 
live in a generation where the imprint of Jacob often is not to be seen by so many of our people. How about Yitzchak? How about the legacy, the imprint of Isaac? The art of prayer, the depth of prayer. The Talmud understood that the Jew goes in the morning, puts on talus and tefillin, and melts away in intimacy with God during the time of prayer. He or she is in a completely different state away from the world. Pour out your heart like water in the presence of God. But in the concluding generations of Jewish history before Mashiach, often the depth, the beauty, the power of prayer is all but forgotten. In fact, the synagogue for millions is seen as a very boring and irrelevant place. You know the story? (laughs) There was the president of a shul, the president of a synagogue who would always sleep during davening and of course during the rabbi's sermon, it's a mitzvah to sleep. So this rabbi would always get up to speak and the president was sleeping. The gabai, the person who was the assistant of the shul, who usually does not like the rabbi, nor does he like the president, comes to the rabbi one day and seeking to take revenge from the president, says, Rabbi, you know, it's really disgusting what's going on. The president of your synagogue sits on top of the stage there and he sleeps through the entire sermon. And the rabbi says, yes, I agree, it's a terrible chutzpah, what do we do? The rabbi says, with your permission, next Shabbos, you give me permission, I'm going to take a bat, and I'm going to go over to the president and knock him over his head to teach him a lesson. And the rabbi says, go ahead, it's a beautiful mitzvah and a very noble thing to do. And sure, next Shabbos comes around, the rabbi gets up to speak, the president is sleeping, the rabbi takes a bat, goes over to the president, boom, on his head. President, shaken up looks up to the gabai and says, do it again, hit me again. The gabai is stunned. The president says, I can still hear him. The art of prayer, the power of prayer, what a davening is, what a davening is, is often forgotten by millions and millions of Jews. And even Jews who attend synagogue routinely, it's often devoid of, of a real experience to say that prayer really touches them and changes them and transforms them, the imprint of Jacob is often very, very hard to find. Comes God and tells Avram, Veheyebracha. At the concluding generations of exile, you will be the blessing. Your legacy, your imprint will never be forgotten. One thing, assimilation, did not destroy. And that's the characteristic of Abraham of Gemilas Hasadim. Jews, all types of Jews, are still extraordinary givers. They give and give and give. The IRS often can't believe Jewish tax returns as they ask, who gives so much charity? Unprecedented, the amount of tzedakah, the amount of charity that Jews give. Yes, sometimes... The causes they give for are questionable. Sometimes one wonders, couldn't they choose better causes? But about this already, the Jerusalem Talmud expressed itself about our people. They said, what an interesting people. When they had to build a golden calf, they gave and gave and gave. And then a few months later, when they had to build a sanctuary, they gave and gave and gave, obsessed with giving. It wasn't even so much for what? It was the fact that they voluntarily gave. The golden calf was created through contributions, and the sanctuary was created through contributions by the same people. Giving is inherent to the Jewish psyche, it's the Jewish character, and we see a fascinating thing. Millions of Jews divorced from the world of Jacob, divorced from the world of Torah, divorced from the world of Yitzchak, of Isaac, separated from the world of prayer. But Avram Avinu's characteristic, the characteristic of charity, of caring, of giving, of donating, of contributing. This has not declined. This has not been lost. This was never assimilated. Even Jews who are sometimes estranged from any element of faith and belief and tradition. But they are powerful defenders of charity, of human rights, of the need to share and give and uplift the oppressed and save the poverty-stricken and help widows and orphans 
and those who are ill and in a that, that's the difficult situation. This then, the Bnei Yisoschar says, is the deeper meaning. God says, usually I'm identified through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but at the last generation, it's going to be Mugin Avraham. You'll still see God in the Jewish people, by every Jew, through Abraham. And that I will always remember. Mugin Avraham, you could find God in every Jew, maybe not always through Torah and prayer, but in his or her passion for kindness, forgiving, which is, which is unique, which is extraordinary. And it's true that Torah and prayer only enhance the quality of giving and accentuate it. But nonetheless, this element has not been affected even by assimilation. The facts speak for themselves. You can research them. And that's the meaning why. That's the meaning of the fact that the blessing concludes Mugain Avraham. God is the protector, the shield of Abraham. What this is actually saying is, I will protect the quality of Abraham. I will not allow the forces of assimilation. I will not allow the forces of intermarriage. I will not allow the forces that have estranged millions and millions and millions of Jews from their roots to estrange them from their first father, from Abraham. That passion, that quality, they will never lose. But they may not know how to read the alphabets. They may not know how to open a siddur. They may not understand the words of the Kaddish, but they will have a passion for justice and for charity. Many of us may not look like Jews anymore. Many of us don't think like Jews anymore. Many of us don't speak like Jews anymore. Many of us don't appear like Jews anymore. But we still give as Jews. Second interpretation. The three patriarchs also represent three spiritual qualities. We know that the first three emotions of the Sephardic tree are chesed, gvura, tiferes. Avram Avinu Abraham represents the quality of chesed, of love. Gemilus chasadim, of kindness. Yitzchak represents the quality of gvura, of strength, of discipline. As we spoke, self-effacement, self-discipline, self-sacrifice. Yaakov represents Midas Ha'emes, the quality of truth. Titain Emes le Yaakov, Chesed Lavram. The prophet says in Micah, give truth to Jacob and kindness to Abraham. Jacob represents the quality of Emes, which is Torah, his Torah story, which is the paradigm of Emes, of truth. Absolute truths, not moral relativism. Throughout history, there are three paths to connect to God. We connect to God through Avram, through kindness, through love. We connect to God through gvura, through strength, through discipline, through challenging ourselves, challenging others. It's an element of rigidity, yira, awe, fear. And we connect to God through emes, through truth. Yachel yiu chaismen bekulon, says the Talmud. You might think that in the last generation of exile, in the final generations of Jewish history, we will also connect through all three paths. Talmud So God says, with you we will conclude, which means this. Throughout our history, there were three ways to educate children. There were three ways to educate ourselves. There's the way of love. There's the way of rigid discipline. And there's the way of truth. When it comes to the end of exile, the primary figure and quality that must be employed is Avram, love. Today, people must have love. People always needed love. People always needed to be embraced. That's true. But there was also a lot of effectiveness. There were lots of results from different paths, from paths of awe, of rigidness. Today, as history comes to a climax before Mashiach comes, the primary quality that has to be used in education in relationships, in outreach, in in, in reach, is Avram Avinu, is to love people, to give them love, to really love them, to show them love. Remember a great moment, a a story I heard. I was once lecturing in California at a Shabbaton, and I met there a very effective and talented principal 
was really running a very nice school from what I saw. And I asked him what were the foundational principles of his work. And he told me that before he became a principal, 25 years ago, he started to think about which teacher of his in elementary school or high school does he remember? Remember in a very positive way. And there was only one teacher that he really cherished till that day. It was his third grade teacher, and he didn't know why. So he called up his third grade teacher decades after he left his class, and he said, you know, Rebbe, my teacher, I still love you, and I don't know why. <laughs> Tell me why you are the only teacher that I really remember. So his teacher says, wow, that's very nice to get a telephone call from you. Why are you asking? And he says, I'm becoming a principal. I'm going into education. Of course, I'll be training teachers, and I need your directions. He says, my direction is very simple. Tell every single one of your teachers that you must love every single student in your classroom. And if there's one student who begs for hate, if there's one student who drives you mad, it's the student that causes you to come home in the evening with a headache every night, that student you must love doubly. So the principal says to me, I asked my third grade teacher, why doubly? Let me love him as much as the other students. And he says, no, you must love him the double portion of love because last year's teacher hated him. The shield of Abraham, the shield of love. Today, it's love that reaches people, that touches people. You must really love them and care for them and show them that you care for them. So you'll open their hearts and reach their minds and touch their souls. Concerning yourself, concerning your spouse, concerning your friends, your community, your children, your students, your disciples and pupils in all forms. And then there's the third interpretation. That the closing generation will be with Avraham and not with Yitzchak and Yaakov. One major phenomenon divides Abraham from his child and grandchild, and that is Isaac grew up in a Jewish home, not just in a Jewish home. He grew up in the home of Avram and Sarah, of Abraham and Sarah. He grew up in a home of holiness, in a home of spiritual passion, in a home of moral justice and unwavering commitment. How about Yaakov Avinu? Or Jacob grew up in the house of Yitzchak, of Rivka holiest people of a generation, until 15 years old, he was also with Avram Avinu, with his grandfather. So Yitzchak and Yaakov both had an education which was permeated and saturated with the value systems of ethical monotheism. But not so Avram Avinu. Avram Avinu grew up in the home of Terach. Terach was a pagan idol worshiper. In fact, Terach had a business of selling statues, which Avram Avinu as a child destroyed and crushed, and because of that was almost executed. Terach was a man who was entrenched in the paganism of his time, a paganism which did not believe in one God, did not believe in the unity of the world, the unity of humanity, a paganism that didn't believe in morality and ethics, a paganism which allowed for the slaughter of children and cannibalism. Avram Avinu grew up in a house that wasn't antithetical to the moral foundations and grandeur of Torah. And he had to discover himself. He had to reinvent himself. Avram Avinu, hikir is boiroi. Avram had to recognize his creator. He had no tutor. He had no father. He had no mother, mentor, educator, environment, school who would teach these truths to him. He had to find these truths with his own mind. And he had to find these truths with his own heart. First Balchuva, the first person to return without an education, he himself searched and searched until he found and discovered. Throughout Jewish history, we have three types of Jews. You could find God, Elake Avram, Elake Yitzchak, Elake Yaakov. You could find God through Abraham, people who came to God through their own search, Elake Yitzchak, 
Others had a father who taught them, a mother who taught them, and a Lakei Yaakov. Others had only, not only had parents, they had Zaydas and Babas. They had grandparents, sometimes from many generations, who saturated the home and the community and the atmosphere with Yiddishkeit, with a sense of Judaism. Yachel yu choysmen bakula. But then we come to the last generations of exile. Here God says it's going to be Mugin Avram. Here the primary path to God will be Abraham. Suddenly now we live in a generation where millions and millions of our brothers and sisters did not grow up in a home of Torah, did not grow up, grow up in a home of the three pillars of Judaism, Avas Hashem, Avas HaTayr, Avas Yisrael, the love of God, the love of Torah, the love of Israel. We spoke about tzedakah, charity, but the systems of Judaism, the ideas of Yiddishkeit, the values, the moral system, the Torah, the mitzvahs, they didn't grow up with it. They didn't see it. They didn't experience it. So God says, you have to know, Avram, that the end of the exile will be just like the beginning of Jewish history. In the words of Sefer Yitzira, no, it's Seifon B'tchilasom, and it's Chilasom B'tchilasom. The beginning is etched in the end, and the end is etched in the beginning. The opening narrative of Jewish history of Ramavino becomes also the final chapter in Jewish history before Mashiach comes. Here the paradigm is going to be of Ramavino. A Jew will look at himself or herself and say, look at my education, look at my background. Don't be afraid. Be like Avram Avinu. If you search, you will be able to discover your own God, just like Abraham discovered his. The main paradigm guiding Jewish history in the last generation of exile is the paradigm and the call for Jews to rediscover themselves, to reinvent themselves, to have the courage to be able to make a metamorphosis, to be able to make a transformation, and despite... What they learned to, they did not learn in their home, in their community, in their schooling. They should be able to discover God just like Abraham. In that sense, it has the greatness that many other generations didn't have. The power for people to choose God on their own and therefore make it truly theirs. This is what the Talmud means. The opening blessing is Avraham, Mitzvah, and Yaakov. You find God three ways. But at the end of Golos, at the end of exile, here the main path is Avram. It's the need for people to search and find God. And this is true even about children who grew up in observant and traditional homes. There is a phenomenon today. They call it in Hebrew, Nishira. Many uh, Jewish youths who grew up in very traditional homes, very observant homes, leave. They leave. There are many reasons for it. There are many factors for it. It's beyond the discussion tonight. But there's also one very powerful, positive element that is being overlooked. And that is many of our children want to become Bali Tshuva. They want to be like Avram Avinu. Many of our children want to and need to discover a Judaism that is personal, that is intimate, they need to be able to experience God, not just receive it as a tradition from the Baba and the Zayda and the father and the mother. Why? Because Mogei Navaram, the last generation of exile, the Zohar says that Mashiach Osid La Sovet Yufta. The great accomplishment of Mashiach is going to be what? According to the Zohar, he's going to make Tzadikim Balichuva, <laughs> which means people who what they call FFB. FFB, from from birth, or I sometimes say fablunged from birth, lost from birth. They should become bali tshuva. They should have the passion and the authenticity of somebody who knew nothing and discovered God from within. It's not maintaining the status quo. It's not committed to the father or the mother. It's very real because I have to reinvent myself. It's not how I was as a child. And there's a very powerful truth to that. It was the truth that characterized Abraham. So at the end of exile, what's Mashiach going to accomplish? The Zohar says that every tzaddik will become a baltruva. Every person who was completely observant has to reignite their spark from within that makes it very real, very personal, very authentic, because it doesn't have the external influence of childhood. So although, although we want to educate, and inspire and raise generations of children and students. At the end of exile, there's a special emphasis on allowing people the personal touch, 
the personal experience to be able to discover God on their own, Elikei Avraham, the God of Abraham, who found God himself. Respect that in your child. Respect that in your student. Nurture it. Bring it out. And then maybe it doesn't have to happen through rebellion. It can happen through love. Finally, I want to conclude with the summation of this. All the three explanations are obviously interconnected. The point is, it's the quality of Abraham that does not seize even with the winds of assimilation. Number one, Jews are still obsessed for giving, for philanthropy. Number two, today there's the call for endless, unconditional love. And number three, today we need to rediscover ourselves as Jews, like Avram Avinu did in his generation. And that's the power to withstand assimilation, knowing that despite assimilation and despite the dire situation of education with Jewish children, if we reach out and we reach in, we can allow Jews to rediscover their deepest souls. And finally, 20 years ago, uh, 20, a little more than 20 years ago, The Lubavitcher Rebbe came out with a call. And I want to share that call with you today. It was the portion of Lech Lecha, Shabbos Lech Lecha, Yud Gimel Cheshvan, the 13th of Cheshvan, Tov Shin Nun, 1989. And I had the privilege of being there and hearing it from the Rebbe's mouth, and I want to share it with you today. The Lubavitcher Rebbe then suggested that in order to saturate our people and the world with a consciousness of giving, of charity, of tzedakah, of goodness and of kindness, he wants to suggest the following. Every office, every company, every organization, every factory, every corporation, and every school. Friday, when payroll is being distributed to the employees, the boss or the manager of the employer should give every one of the employees an extra amount of money. It can be a dollar, can be 50 cents, could be $5 for charity. Tell them in addition to your wage, here is an extra amount of money for you to distribute to charity. Every school, before the children are dismissed for the weekend, the principal or the teacher should distribute to every child a sum of money for charity, a nickel, a dime, a quarter, a dollar. The same is true colleges, universities, all educational institutions, and all institutions. And the Rebbe suggested this for Jewish institutions, and said also for non-Jewish institutions, because tzedakah, charity, is a quality and an ideal that belongs to all of humankind. In fact, one of the seven Noahide laws, according to many opinions, tzedakah, charity. So it's something that has to be encouraged among all of humanity. Imagine the impact of this on employees, on children, on students. Not through words, not through lectures, not through preaching, but through a simple deed. Every weekend, you give the child an extra amount of money just to give for charity. Every employee gets a little bit extra just to give for charity, whenever payroll is, whether once a week or once in two weeks and so forth. Imagine the consciousness this can create a consciousness of giving and charity, and how many acts of charity will be performed if this is instituted? How many acts of stucco will be performed if every person who has a job in their office or company gets this extra sum of money to give for charity? This suggestion of the Rebbe, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, I heard from him, as I said, in 89. And tonight, I want to bring it to your attention make a request of you and a suggestion to you that you and us should begin implementing this. As you know, it's very simple. Everybody can do it in their office, in their classroom, in their corner, and speak to your friends and your employees about it to encourage others. And in no time, these acts can be quadrupled. 
myriads and myriads and myriads of times. And the amount of goodness and kindness that will be inculcated into people's hearts is extraordinary. The amount of charity that will be performed is extraordinary. And the world will be saturated with the quality of Avraham in the conclusion of exile, the quality of giving, of philanthropy, of goodness and kindness. Good night.